All right. Well, hopefully we're going to have a little fun this evening talking about my absolute favorite subject, adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress, and how we can use that science to improve outcomes for the next generation. How does that sound? All right, so, you know, this all uh, started for me way back in 2005 when I finished my residency in pediatrics and I, I wanted to go someplace where I could use my talents, right? A place where I could put my training to use to improve the health of the community. And um, <laughs> a funny thing, I was one of the last people in my pediatric residency class to get a job. In fact, um, you know, my other co-residents, after a while, it was getting closer to the end of the year, they felt really bad for me. <laughs> um, um, but it wasn't that I hadn't been offered a job, it was just that I hadn't found a place where I felt like I could really make a difference in communities. In fact, I was even offered a job to stay on at Stanford as part of the faculty. And I will tell you right now, my Jamaican mother literally almost had a heart attack, okay? Um, she, you know, she was like, Nadine, Stanford faculty! You know, this is like a Jamaican mother's dream. Um, but, uh, but I'm really glad I held out uh, because I ended up coming to work for California Pacific Medical Center, which is actually one of the largest private hospitals in Northern California. And together, we opened a clinic in Bayview Hunters Point, one of San Francisco's most underserved neighborhoods. And just to give you, you know, a, a, a little bit of flavor of what Bayview Hunters Point is like, right? Um, you know, keep in mind that San Francisco is one of the wealthiest cities in the United States, right? Um, and Bayview Hunters Point is this little area that's tucked inside of, of this community. It has the highest... Uh, number of children of any neighborhood in San Francisco. At this point, I think it's actually true that dogs are outnumbering kids in San Francisco. Um, it has the highest rate of home ownership in the city, and it's historically been this enclave where African, African American families for a long time were living and thriving in San Francisco. Um, but over the last uh, couple decades, it, it has seen significant decline. And at this point, Bayview Hunters Point, there, it, it is one of the areas with the highest rates of violence. And in fact, when you look at the leading causes of death in San Francisco, for most of the city, it's just like the rest of the country, heart disease, number one uh, leading cause of death. In a few neighborhoods in San Francisco, HIV AIDS is the leading cause of death. But in Bayview Hunters Point, violence is the leading cause of early mortality, right? And this was a place where I really felt I could put my skills and my talents to use. So we hung a shingle. And, um, you know, at, when you decide to set up shop, in a community like Bayview Hunters Point, you can't just, you know, create a website, right, and open your doors and think that people are going to be marching in. Because for those who are familiar with doing work in these types of communities, you gotta put in the face time, right? You have to get out there because there are so many people who have come before us with all kinds of promises, who have been there for some period of time, right, and then disappeared. 
And so for me, when I came in to provide services in Bayview Hunters Point, it was really important for me to recognize the legacy of what had come before me. And so I put in the time. I went to schools and churches and after school programs and community based programs. And I came to folks and I said, Hi, I'm Dr. Burke. This was before I was married. And I said, You know, we're opening a clinic in this community. And I, my goal is to make sure that our kids can be as healthy as they can possibly be. And a funny thing happens when people see you sit through three consecutive church sun services on a Sunday, right? Or when they see you literally, and this is the truth, I went door to door in the Hunters Point housing projects. I am not joking. And I would knock on the door, take a step back, Right? And, you know, I would say to folks, hi. I would introduce myself and I would say, you know, we're opening a clinic right here in the community. Please send us your kids. Right? Because despite the fact that San Francisco has one of the highest physician per capita ratios in the United States, Bayview Hunters Point was a federally designated medically underserved area. There was only one pediatrician to serve more than 10,000 children in that community. And so I guess when people sit, see you in, on Sunday in the, uh, in the church and when they see you go door to door in the housing projects, people start to believe that maybe you're the real deal. And so an amazing thing happened was that when we opened our doors, the community entrusted me with their greatest treasure, their children. And little by little, right, when, when we open our doors, what I saw was that folks were referring patients to me more and more. And then as I was seeing these patients, right, folks would say to me, Dr. Burke, can you please see Bobby? Bobby can't sit still. He's hitting the kid next to him. He's falling out in class. Please, Dr. Burke, he's got ADHD. Can you put him on some Ritalin? And so I said, sure, of course, come on, send him down. I will take a look at him. But when I did what I was trained to do, when I actually did a thorough history and physical exam, what I found was that for most of my patients, I couldn't make a diagnosis of ADHD, right? And the reason is, is that if you actually, when you take the time to read the diagnostic criteria, right, it has a lot of the symptoms that my patients were exhibiting, right? Poor impulse control, uh, difficulty with attention, uh, quick to anger, right? All of these different things. But at the bottom, there's just one little line at the bottom, right, that says, and these symptoms are not caused by any other mental health disorder. Now, I'm not a mental health professional, I'm a pediatrician, but if there's one thing, I'm, I'm, I'm a real stickler, right, for these diagnostic criteria. Like, I'm, I'm a real science nerd, I'm one of those people that if it says, you know, if that's what it says in the fine print, I gotta look a little deeper. And my question was, wait a minute, what if it's not a mental health disorder per se, but what if it is just a 
good old fashioned biological disorder, right? I mean, aren't mental health disorders, for the most part, aren't these biological disorders anyways? What if what's really going on is what my kids are being exposed to is what's affecting their health. Because guess what? It wasn't just their behavior, right? I also noticed that my patients who had the most challenging health outcomes had something very powerfully in common with my patients who were having the most challenging behavioral outcomes. And that was that all of these kids were being exposed to really high doses of adversity. And then when I'm talking about adversity, right, I am talking about, for one family, I remember they had three kids. And their divorce became so bitterly acrimonious, right, including the discharge of firearms, that they were court mandated to do their custody exchanges at the Bayview police station, right? Or the family who came, uh, who brought in these twins, I will never forget uh, these two twins that were brought in by their grandmother who were having all kinds of difficulty in school, trouble with attention, started fighting after they had witnessed an attempted murder in their home. Right? And these were all of the kids that folks were saying, please, Dr. Burke, can you put him on some Ritalin? And for me, I have to say, I was not willing to do it. Because when I saw this powerful trend, this powerful association between my kids who were being exposed to the worst doses of adversity and the, my kids who were having the most challenging behavioral and health problems, by the way, right? Like the 10-year-old girl who came into my office with severe, severe asthma. I remember I was throwing the kitchen sink at her. I was doing my best putting her on powerful medications just to keep her out of the hospital, right? And then one day I had her mom, she came back in with another asthma exacerbation. So I sat down with her mom and I said, let's do this one more time. Let's talk about, let's go over her potential asthma triggers, right? We've, put, we've got the, the dust covers on the mattresses on the and the pillowcases, right? There's no pets at home. You know, we're going through, we, we're on, you're on all of the controller medications. Can you think, what is it that could be, you know, triggering your daughter's asthma? Is it pollen? Is it cleaning products? And I'll tell you what this mom said to me. She said, you know, doctora, I noticed that my daughter's asthma tends to act up every time her dad punches a hole in the wall. And so for me, I started connecting the dots to understand what was underlying this disturbing trend that I was seeing in my patients. And learning how to connect these dots, figuring out how to put these pieces together, is something that I learned from a very early age. This question about, you know, how to look for the story beneath the story. And I learned it from my dad. So, Basil Burke is a biochemist, he's a Jamaican immigrant, and I think I figured out pretty early on that he was not like other dads, okay? So when my family came from Kingston, Jamaica, right, 
when I was four and a half years old, five kids in tow, right? I have uh, four brothers, and we would be acting like crazy people, right? We were little hellions when we were little. And uh, my dad would walk up on the five of us, right, throwing paper airplanes at each other, acting crazy. And instead of doing what your typical parent would do, right, stop that now or you're going to put your eye out. Oh, no. What Basil Burke would do is that he would grab his stopwatch and a tape measure, and he would say, okay, now if you measure the distance of your throw, right, and then you time how long it takes for the airplane to travel that distance, you can calculate the velocity, right? And then with gravity at 9.8 meters per second squared, you can figure out the lift under the wings of the airplane. And of course, you guys know that this was genius parenting, right? Because the minute the physics lesson would start, my brothers would drop their paper airplanes and get the heck out of there. But not me. I couldn't get enough. My dad brought physics and chemistry and biology to bear on every thing that we did. Literally, we were, you know, sitting down to dinner, having curry chicken, because we're Jamaicans, we eat curry, right? And I remember spilling some of the curry onto my white blouse. And as I went to wash it out, I noticed that the curry stain turned from a bright yellow to a purpley pink the minute I touched it with a bar of soap. And of course, my dad, oh, well, curry must be an acid-base indicator, right? This, this is how I was raised to see the world. What my dad taught me is that behind every natural phenomenon, there is a molecular mechanism. You just have to look for it. And so when I was seeing patient after patient in Bayview Hunters Point who were being exposed to these incredible doses of adversity and who were also manifesting some of the worst symptoms, for me, the question was, what is the biological mechanism that I'm seeing being played out in front of me. And for a long time, the actual, the idea of an actual biological link between early adversity and these differences in, in my patients' health and behavioral outcomes, you know, they, they came to me as just like a fleeting thought, just uh, an idea. But as I was seeing these families in Bayview Hunters Point, slowly but surely that began to fill in the dots for me. And so I threw myself into the literature and I started reading paper after paper about how adversity in childhood affects the developing brains and bodies of children. And then one day, my colleague walked into my office, and in his hand was a copy of a research study called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And that day changed my clinical practice dramatically. And I want to share with you a little bit about what that aha moment was like for me when I first read the Adverse Childhood Experiences study. Here it was, the final piece of the puzzle that pulled all the others into place. Everything that I had experienced in the past 10 years, all of those questions and observations I couldn't quite put together, finally, had a linchpin. 
with my heart knocking in my chest, I started to read aloud the particularly mind-blowing parts of the study, occasionally stopping to whisper shout in Jamaican Patois. The first thing that struck me about Felidi and Anda's research was how incredibly robust it was. They reported data from 17,421 people. It was a large enough number to find the type of validation I never thought that I would find. When I finished reading the study, my excitement hadn't diminished. I felt like Neo at the end of the movie, The Matrix, where suddenly the world is dripping with green numbers. Not only was I seeing the full reality of what was all around me, but I understood it. According to the ACE study, I wasn't the only one making connections between the stress of childhood adversity and bad health outcomes. This piece of the puzzle, this final piece of code in the matrix, was just what I needed to make sense of what was going on with my patients and, more importantly, to treat them. At the time, I knew this moment, this understanding, was going to profoundly change my clinical practice. But I had no idea how much it would change my life. So that was my matrix moment when I first learned about the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And just as a quick show of hands, how many folks have heard of the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study? Oh, dang! That's fantastic! And um, so when I first learned about the Adverse Childhood uh, Experience Study, so this was a study for the three of you who did not raise your hand. <laughs> I'm just messing around. Um, this was a study that was done by the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and Kaiser Permanente, the healthcare, care, healthcare giant. And in it, they asked 17 and a half thousand people about their exposure to 10 categories of adverse childhood experiences. And these include physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, physical and emotional neglect, or growing up in a household where a parent was mentally ill, substance dependent, incarcerated, where there was parental separation or divorce, or domestic violence. And for every yes, you would get a point on your ACE score. And then what they did was they correlated ACE scores against health outcomes. And what they found was absolutely striking. Two things. Number one, ACEs are incredibly common. Two-thirds of their population had at least one category of adverse childhood experiences, and one in eight folks had four or more adverse childhood experiences, right? And this was not Bayview Hunter's point. This was Kaiser San Diego. Their population was 70% Caucasian, 70% college educated. And this data has now been repeated by the CDC in 32 states and the District of Columbia. And of those that report their data, all of them report between half and two thirds of the population with at least one adverse childhood experience and between 13 and 17% of the population with four or more adverse childhood experiences. Right. Then the second thing that they found was that the higher your ACE score, the worse your health outcomes. For example, a person with an ACE score of four or more was twice as likely to develop heart disease, the number one killer in America. 
twice as likely to develop cancer, two and a half times as likely to have a stroke, almost four times as likely to develop chronic lung disease as a person with zero ACEs. Now, when I first learned about this science, the first thing that I did was try to understand how do I use this information to help my kids, right? But in order to be able to do that, right, the first thing that I had to do is understand what is the biological mechanism, right? Because when we understand the mechanism, then we can use that science for prevention and treatment. And let me give you a little example from recent medical history, right? Back in the early 80s, doctors started seeing patients coming in with really high rates of tuberculosis, right? So what did we do? We're like, tuberculosis, we know how to treat that. Write the prescription, send you out the door. And then folks were coming in with these really high rates of this rare pneumonia called pneumocystis pneumonia, right? And we said, oh, pneumocystis pneumonia, okay, that's pretty rare, I gotta look it up. But we know the treatment for that. Here's this prescription, send you out the door. And then patients were coming in with this really high rates of this rare type of skin cancer called Kaposi sarcoma, right? And we said, wow, Kaposi sarcoma. Woo, gotta go back to the medical books for that one. But I know exactly what to do. Refer you to the, the right specialist. We know how to treat this. What do you think happened? Patients kept on coming back and coming back and coming back and every time that they were sicker, right? Because it turns out that when we were writing all those prescriptions for tuberculosis and pneumonia, we weren't touching the underlying cause because the underlying cause, as we now know, was a virus that was infecting the very immune system, right? HIV AIDS. And when we figured that out, when we figured out what was the root cause, right? Oh snap, it's a virus. Wait, no, it's a retrovirus. Then we were able to develop antiretrovirals. And guess what, y'all? That's when HIV AIDS went from, in the early 80s, a mean mortality of six months. One half of people were dead six months, from diagnosis, uh, six months from diagnosis, to now a greater than 50 year life expectancy from the time of diagnosis. That is what we are able to accomplish when we don't just focus on treating the surface symptoms and we invest the time and the resources in figuring out how do we tackle the underlying root cause. So when it comes to the connection between childhood adversity and poor health outcomes, for me, I got to know the mechanism, right? And we now understand that it has to do with the changes in the very function of our biological stress response, right? And it works a little something like this. Imagine you're walking in the forest and you see a bear. Did I scare you? <laughs> At least a little bit. I'm not very scary, right? But what happens, right? What happens in our bodies immediately your amygdala, right, it is the part of the brain, it sounds the alarm, and it activates our biological fight or flight response. So our body starts releasing all these stress hormones, adrenaline, cortisol, that are associated with all those feelings that we feel when we're terrified, right? 
So our heart starts to pound. Our pupils dilate. Our airways open up. We shunt blood to our large skeletal muscles for running and jumping and away from that itty bitty muscle that holds your bladder closed so you may pee your pants, right? No judgment, right? And you are ready to either fight that bear or run from the bear, right? But if you were to think about it, Fighting a bear wouldn't seem like a good idea, would it? And that is why when your amygdala is activated, especially when we're in very high doses of adversity, it sends projections to the prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that's responsible for things like judgment and impulse control and executive functioning. And it turns it way, way down. Because you don't want something like judgment getting in the way of survival, right? And instead, it turns up the part of the brain known as the noradrenergic nucleus of the locus ceruleus, or as I like to call it, the part of the brain responsible for I don't know karate, but I do know karate, right? <laughs> this is the within the brain stress response system and it's responsible for getting us amped up. Now, the less obvious thing that happens when we activate our fight or flight response, right, is that it also activates our immune response. Because if that bear gets his claws into you, you want your immune system to be primed to bring inflammation to stabilize the wound. It's brilliant. It was designed over millennia to save our lives from a mortal threat. But the problem is what happens when that bear comes home every night. And this system is activated over and over and over and over and over again. And it can actually lose its ability to turn itself off normally. And it goes from being adaptive or life-saving to maladaptive or health-damaging. Children are especially sensitive to this repeated activation of the stress response because their brains and bodies are just developing. So high doses of adversity can actually change the structure and function of children's developing brains. They, but not just their brains. Also, their developing immune system, the developing hormonal systems, and even the way their DNA is read and transcribed. So when I first learned about uh, this science, the first thing that I did was we actually did something called a chart review. We actually looked in the uh, medical uh, charts of all of our patients to understand um, like, hey, this may have happened to those folks in Kaiser San Diego, but who knows if our kids at Bayview have been exposed. No, I'm just kidding. I'm a scientist. We still got to confirm, right? So we went and um, we went through every single medical chart and looked to see the extent to which we could document uh, adverse childhood experiences in our patients' history. And I want to share with you a moment about what that process uh, revealed for us. At first, the ACE scores of our study population of 702 patients looked a lot like Felidi and Anda's. 67% had experienced at least one ACE, and 12% had experienced four or more. I have to admit, I was surprised that our numbers weren't higher. After all, Bayview is a pretty rough neighborhood. 
I knew the questions that were asked by the CDC and Kaiser didn't cover everything my patients had been through, like community violence or having a family member deported, both common occurrences in the lives of my kids. But still, I expected our patients in Bayview to have experienced more ACEs than the Kaiser population. But then I had a forehead slapping realization. Felidi and Anda had done their study among adults. The mean age of their patients was 55. And their subjects were asked to recall the number of ACEs experienced by the time they were 18. In our study, the mean age was eight. Many of our kids would likely have more ACEs before they reached their 18th birthdays. And we also had to consider that it was their caregivers, not the kids themselves, who were reporting the, the adverse experiences that we were charting. And these caregivers might not have reported adversity accurately because of shame or fear or because we just don't talk about these things. Apart from these revelations, the profound discovery was that our patients with four or more ACEs were twice as likely to be overweight or obese and 32.6 times as likely to have been diagnosed with learning or behavior problems. I'm gonna say that again. 32.6 times as likely to have been diagnosed with learning or behavior problems. When our statistician from Stanford first called to tell me how these numbers shook out, I was overwhelmed by a mix of emotions. Elation at making an important scientific discovery and a profound aching in my heart for all of the kids who were struggling in school and being told they had ADHD or a behavior problem when these problems were directly correlated with toxic doses of adversity. And I have to say one other thing about that research study that we did was that when we looked across our uh, demographics of our study population, there was a crazy bit of, bit of good news that I almost missed. I almost missed the good news. I was so busy looking at, you know, the odds ratios and the relative risk and all this stuff, working it out with a statistician, that here's what I didn't notice. For our patients who had four or more ACEs, right, we saw the same dose-response relationship. For our kids with uh, zero ACEs, only 3% of them had learning and behavior problems. Uh, for uh, zero to three ACEs, it was like 21%. And for our kids with four or more ACEs, uh, it was 51.2%. More than half of them had learning and behavior problems. So I was really focused on the relative risk and all this stuff, and I almost missed it. For our kids who had zero ACEs, only 3% of them had learning and behavior problems. For our black and brown kids in Bayview Hunters Point, all living in the same neighborhood, all living in this really challenged neighborhood, if they had zero ACEs, only 3% of them had learning and behavior problems. Right? And folks have asked me when I talk about that research later on, they said, okay, well, you know, when kids have four or more ACEs, only half of them had behavior problems. So what is it about the other half that made them resilient and, you know? And I was like, can we focus on making sure that more of our kids are in that zero ACEs category? Right? And that is exactly what I have been dedicating myself to since I learned about this research. Making sure that more of our kids stay in that zero ACEs category. 
But not only that, understanding for our kids who are exposed, how do we make sure that they get the appropriate treatment and evidence-based care that they need? Because guess what? If there's one thing about all this science and research, I mean, you guys may notice that I'm this total science geek, but the, the reason about it, the reason for that is because if there's one thing that this science shows us, is that this is incredibly hopeful, right? Number one, one of the first things that the science shows us is that when we do early detection and early intervention, kids do better. Full stop. It's unequivocal. And when I'm talking about better, I'm not talking about they feel better. I am talking about decrease risk. We're talking about improve brain structure and function on MRI. We're talking about reduced stress hormones, reduced markers of inflammation. We are talking about healing that goes all the way down to the DNA, right? How many of you folks heard of uh, Michael Meany and his research on rat pups uh, from McGill University, right? You guys got to peep chapter six of this book, Lick Your Pups. I had so much fun writing this book because this book is all about solutions. And in chapter six, I talk about um, Michael Meany and the, and the research that he did where he had these, um, these mama rats and the baby rats, right? These mama rats, they'd give birth to these baby rats. And the researchers would take these baby rats, right, right after they were born, and they would stress them out, right? And after they'd stress them out, they'd give them back to their mamas. And what they found was that some of these mama rats naturally did a lot of licking and grooming and soothing and comforting behavior for their babies, right? They call these high lickers. And other moms, yeah, not so much, right? They didn't do a lot of licking and grooming and whatever. The human equivalent of what would be hugs and kisses, right? They just weren't that into it. And then what they did was that they tested the, 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 these baby rats and all these different functions. Well, what do you think happened? The rats that were raised by these high licking and grooming moms, they performed better on cognitive tests. They had a more healthy and normally functioning stress response that would turn itself off after the stressor was over, right? And what they found was that all of these changes in, in behavior and, um, and performance was associated with actually, they could measure markers on the DNA. The baby rats who had these high liquor moms, their DNA had these, these different markers on them, right? And guess what? When those baby rats grew up to have their own baby rats, they were high liquors, right? And unfortunately, Vice versa for the low lickers. But then they did something a little crazy. And I don't know if it's because Michael Meany's been watching Lifetime television, <laughs> but they, for the next generation, they took the baby rats and they switched them at birth, right? So the minute these babies were born, the babies who were the biological offspring of the low liquor rats were being raised by these high liquor rats who did this lots of licking and grooming. And what do you think happened? They performed better on the cognitive tests. They had a more normally functioning stress response that would turn itself off more regularly. And they themselves had the DNA markers, not of their biological mothers, but of the mothers who had reared them. It was actually the grooming behavior that released, turned out to be serotonin in these rats 
that ultimately led to this DNA marker. And guess what? When those baby rats grew up with this DNA marker, they became high lickers when they themselves had, had their own pups. When I am talking about the power of nurturant caregiving, I'm not just talking about I feel better. We are talking about healing that goes all the way down to our DNA, right? So when we are thinking about how we can improve outcomes for kids who are exposed to high doses of adversity, let me tell you something right now. The biggest challenge that we have, ladies and gentlemen, is myth and misinformation. Thank you. Myth number one, this only happens in certain communities. Completely bogus. We know that from the ACE study, right? 70% Caucasian, 70% college educated. This research has been repeated, in fact, in over 23 countries around the world. This affects upper income, lower income, black, brown, Caucasian, and everyone in between, right? Myth number two, there's nothing that we can do about it. All of the science shows us, right, that safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments are healing for children. I'm gonna say that one more time. Safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments are healing for children. But in order for us to put this into practice and get the maximum benefit, right? We have to start with universal screening. Screening every single child for adverse childhood experiences as a routine part of their medical care. Because somehow, despite the fact that this research was published now, two decades ago, right? Still today, only 4% of pediatricians in this country are screening for adverse childhood experiences, right? How is that possible? Because of myth and misinformation. When I talk to my colleagues, they say, oh, well, I don't know if there's anything that I can do. I don't have the resources. This is too challenging. It's too big. We can't, we can't solve this. When I first started talking about this issue, people thought I was crazy. They would say to me, oh, my God, it's two-thirds of Americans who have experienced one adverse childhood experience. How do you think you're going to solve that? And I remember the day that it occurred to me. I said, well, shoot. If two-thirds of Americans have experienced at least one adverse childhood experience, that means two-thirds of Americans know what the heck this feels like. That's the cavalry. That's the solution. These are all of the people who are going to help us do all of the things that we know make a difference. And number one is raising awareness. Shouting it from the rooftops, y'all. We need you to raise your voices and advocate for doing things differently, right? Number two is making sure that every single one of my colleagues, every pediatrician in America is doing routine screening for adverse childhood experiences. Number three is when we identify kids who have adverse childhood experiences that we put into, into practice the evidence about what things actually heal kids. And we know that healthy relationships are powerful but we also know things like good old-fashioned mental health care. Yeah, it still works, right? Mental health interventions. Some of the best ways that we can do that, what we do at our center, the Center for Youth Wellness, is we employ some of these best practices, right? Integrated primary care and behavioral health. Team-based care. These things are actually demonstrated to improve outcomes for kids, right? But in addition to healthy relationships and mental health interventions, there are also uh, interventions that can mitigate the effect of the biological effects 
of toxic stress. Things like regular exercise that help to reduce stress hormones, right? Reduce inflammation, help our immune system to function more healthy, in a more healthy way, and help to enhance neuroplasticity. Things like mindfulness, meditation, right? Again, reduce stress hormones, reduce inflammation, and enhance neuroplasticity. Certain types of nutrition, right? Getting regular sleep and having good sleep hygiene. These are all things that I talk about in The Deepest Well because the focus of the book is on advancing solutions, right? But in order to be able to, to do this work, in order to be able to provide this buffering care for kids who have experienced adversity, we gotta do a pulse check, y'all. We have to check our own how our own stress response is functioning. Because when we're talking about two-thirds of the population, we're not talking about those folks over there. Right? We're talking about us. This is all of us. Right? And, and whether you are a teacher, right? Or you're a parent, or whether you're running a program, or you're, you know, in whatever capacity, that we are engaging with young people, right? If we do not understand and have a check, hey, how's my stress response functioning, right? When I've got this little person in front of me in my face, right? Activating my fight or flight response. Does my fight or flight response shut itself off when it's supposed to, right? And just taking a look at what our own ACE score is. One of the things our center has done was, is uh, create a, a website called Stress Health, where folks can go and take their own ACE test and uh, learn what they can do to help to be a buffer for the young people in their lives. And the other piece about this, when we are doing our own pulse check, is that it is never too late for healing. I'm gonna say that again. This is the truth, this is what all the research is showing us. It is never too late for healing. If you are an adult and you have your own high ACE score, right? The first thing is just understand what the heck is going on in the first place, right? So checking in with yourself and figuring out, okay, how is my stress response? Is it working okay or is it a little bit overactive, right? And then once you figure that out, right, doing those same healing interventions that work for kids, sleep, exercise, nutrition, mindfulness, mental health, healthy relationships, guess what? They work for us, right? And you can kind of do a pulse check and see like what really works for me? Is it when I go for that run? Is it rocking out for that, with that music? Is it the yoga class? Is it talking to my girlfriend? Or do I, I really need to make an appointment with my therapist, right? When we understand what the mechanism is, right, then we can go from there to understand what helps us bring our own stress, re stress response back under control. And finally, I want to say one of the, the last pieces is that each of us has to be an advocate. We have the power to profoundly change the way our society responds to the issue of adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress, right? Come on, you guys know what this public health change looks like. You remember back in the day? When folks would be driving with the four kids in the back seat of the car, none of them wearing seat belts, windows all rolled up, you know, mom or dad is smoking that cigarette, right? And then we all figured out, like, hey, secondhand smoke kills, right? 
And then we put policies in place to say, click it or ticket, right? You can't ride around with all your kids in the back of the car with no seat belt, right? We got to put, we, we put in a place, say, oh, you know what? You're not allowed to smoke in bars anymore. You're not allowed to smoke in restaurants anymore. You're not allowed to smoke in, um, in airplanes anymore. And y'all remember when you used to go to the club and you get, come home and your clothes would stank and you got to wash your hair? Do you remember that? Nobody even reminds. I was talking, I was giving a talk the other day. And there were kids sitting in the front row, and they were like, no way, that never happened, no. <laughs> we have the power to profoundly change the way our society responds to the issue of adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress. <laughs> and for me, this science is like germ theory, right? Back in the day, doctors used to think, you know, oh, you know, infection is caused by foul airs, right? So when a patient was sick, they would bring flowers in the bedside to help make them healthier, right? To get nice smells to get rid of the foul airs. They'd open up the windows, right? But then they would move from patient to patient covered in blood and viscera, right? Because if you'd go, if you're a doctor and you really cared about your patient, right? If you're a surgeon and you really want to make sure that patient lives, right? We, we, back in the day, we'd say, okay, it's that foul smell. And in fact, the worse that that patient's wounds smell, the more urgent it is. So I got to get out over there as quick as possible. No time to wash my hands between the last patient that I just cut up and this guy. I'm going to get in there as quick as possible because I want to be the best doctor that I can be and I want to make sure I can save that guy's life, right? And then this crazy guy named Pasteur, he had this idea that like, oh, maybe infection is caused by microbes and it can be spread from one person to the next, right? Including by you, doctor on that dirty white coat that you're wearing, right? And when we understood this science, we began to do things differently. Everything from washing our hands, to sterilizing our surgical instruments, to doing things like developing antibiotics. But not just that, right? We, we began doing crazy things like municipal sanitation. Right? Because when we understand what the root cause is, then we can be far more targeted and effective in developing our solutions. And I want to leave you all with this. I believe that we are standing on the cusp of a new revolution. And it is every bit as consequential as the one sparked by Pasteur's discovery of germs. And what's exciting is that the movement has already begun. Right now, we're in the hand-washing stage. We have yet to develop fourth-generation antibiotics in the fight against toxic stress. But we can use the knowledge of how the stress response triggers health problems to institute some basic hygiene, screening, trauma-informed care and treatment, sleep, exercise, nutrition, mindfulness, mental health, and healthy relationships. These are the equivalent of Dr. Joseph Lister dipping his instruments in carbolic acid to sterilize them and requiring his surgical students to wash their hands. When we understand that the source of so many of our society's problems is exposure to childhood adversity, the solutions are as simple as reducing the dose of adversity for kids and enhancing the ability of their caregivers to be buffers. From there, we keep working our way up, translating that understanding into the creation of things like more effective educational curricula and the development of blood tests to identify biomarkers for toxic stress. 
things that will lead to a wide range of solutions and innovations, reducing harm bit by bit and then leap by leap. The cause of the harm, whether it's microbes or childhood adversity, does not need to be totally eradicated. The revolution is in the creative application of knowledge to mitigate that harm wherever it pops up. Because when you know the mechanism, you can use that understanding in countless ways to drastically improve the human condition. This is how you spark a revolution. You shift the frame, you change the lens, and all at once, the world is revealed, and nothing is the same. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. My question to you is talking about the public policy to bring up around this wonderful uh, plan that you have. Uh, because you describe public policy around other public health issues, they were usually prohibitive or you know, in some way involved in preventing people from smoking, things like this. This is proactive, what you're talking about. Yes. So you're talking about perhaps mental health education in schools, like they teach gym, things like that that have been talked about in this platform before. Do you have other public policy initiatives in mind? Do you have a lobbying effort behind any of those? How can we be part of the Calvary and really um, advocate for some of these solutions that you're talking about? So, chapter nine, <laughs> entitled Sexiest Man Alive, um, um, details some examples of how we have advocated for um, uh, really fundamental changes and particularly, you all know newborn screening, for anybody who's had a baby, you know when the baby's born, they poke the heel and they send it off for all of these tests, right? Well, we didn't used to do that. That started in the 60s and I don't wanna give it away. Um, uh, but I, I really talk about what that took in order to make that happen. And, um, and, you know, what that requires is a couple of things. Number one, it requires um, folks, you know, committed, passionate folks advocating to make that happen. And it started with, you know, uh, little bit by little bit, they made it the policy in a, in a couple of hospitals, and then they made it the policy in another couple of hospitals. And um, I actually talked about uh, a couple of different examples of um, moving to a policy of universal screening for different uh, healthcare conditions. And in some cases, that advocacy was led by doctors. In other cases, that advocacy was led by mothers, right? And um, uh, but I included that to show the power of this advocacy uh, in being able to change norms and that a lot of the things that we take for granted every day are as the result of the hard work coming together of folks who decided that they wanted to see things different, who wanted to protect the health and well-being and safety of children. And so um, uh, I have a couple of examples of that in the book. Um, and it's really, we need to be holding our policy makers accountable. And it can be big P policy makers. It can even be, you know, what we're doing in terms of our school policies, right? What we're doing in the organizations that we work with. There's a lot of ways in which when we advocate, even in our own backyard, the ripple effects keep moving out and we can really change the status quo. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Harris, for being not only being here today, but also for your conviction and your willingness to challenge the status quo for the betterment of us all. Um, I have a number of questions, but only have one burning one, uh, and that's related to epigenetic inheritance of your research and the impact of high doses of uh, toxic stress and trauma 
multi-generationally. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so um, there's, there has been um, significant research looking in, uh, uh, in, in several different communities. Some of this work has been done in uh, the descendants of folks who um, went through the Holocaust. Uh, some of this work has been done uh, by in, in uh, different kind of natural disasters. Um, you know, the Canadian ice storm, the uh, different uh, scenarios. And what we see is that um, th these markers can be handed down from generation to generation. Um, um, but we also, um, there is also evidence that when we do strong, nurturant caregiving, right, that that also can be powerful in terms of our epigenetic um, regulation. And so it's really about how do we create this um, systemic and society-wide um, effort, essentially a public health effort, to ensure that more children can get that safe, stable, nurturing relationship and environments that we know are healing all the way down to the genetic level. Sure. Thank you. Nadine over here. Hi, thank you. I have a quick question. Does, uh, the, is there an updated ACE version? Girl, I'm so glad you asked that. Please see Appendix 2 <laughs> in the deepest well. Um, so our incredible team at the Center for Youth Wellness um, uh, actually looked at more than 16,000 research studies. And there's only, if there's one thing that makes me mad as a scientist, right, is when this research is stuck in these journals and doesn't get put into practice. It drives me crazy. And one of the things that we looked at, right, is that we understand that these traditional 10 ACEs that the original researchers, Felidi and Anda, looked at were the ones that were most common in the population that they saw, right? But in the intervening 20 years, what we understand much more now is that the mechanism, the underlying uh, cause, the underlying biology is this biology of toxic stress, and that's what leads to these long-term negative health outcomes. And we know that the traditional 10 ACEs are risk factors for toxic stress, but we also recognize that they're not the only risk factors for toxic stress. And that is what our team at the Center for Youth Wellness works so hard to do. And that is how, uh, is identify those additional risk factors. And we included them in our updated ACE screening tool, which is included at the back of the book. Um, and for any clinicians or, um, uh, primary care clinicians in the audience, they, they can get also all of our updated tools at uh, the National Pediatric Practice Community on ACE Screening, nppcaces.org. But um, in, in Appendix 2, you'll see the uh, updated ACE screening tool that the Center for Youth Wellness has developed that includes things like separation from your caregiver by deportation or migration, or um, a parent or guardian who who, a parent or caregiver who died, which was actually not in the original ACE study, or um, uh, the adversity of discrimination, whether it's on the basis of race or national origin or um, uh, whatever. And so all of those are included in Appendix 2. Susan? Hi. Hi. Uh, thanks for coming and speaking about this. This is uh, wonderful. I'm, a, I'm actually a, mostly a child and adolescent psychiatrist in the community here. I do see some adults as well. Um, and this is something we actually discussed at the recent uh, American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry conference. So I'm, I'm glad this is becoming much more, um, it, there's a lot more awareness surrounding this uh, important topic. I wanted to get your opinion on um, something that I run across often almost daily, it seems like an epidemic um, of adverse uh, things that can affect, um, adversely affect kids uh, that I think we don't often speak about, <coughs> such as uh, ex excessive screen time, overly <coughs> permissive parenting, um, you know, lack of structure, uh, poor nutrition, lack of exercise, uh, lack of uh, self-soothing, 
kind of skills, you know, not, not teaching those kind of things. Um, I feel like all those things, and also <coughs> uh, even lack of encouraging uh, altruism, because that's a, that's a major defense mechanism, sense of humor, those things are defense mechanisms against stress, we know that. But it's not something that um, I see most child psychiatrists even talking about or screening for. Well, that's a lot of things you just talked about. <laughs> So, um, sure, you know, screen time and lack of exercise and uh, poor nutrition are all things that I, I touch on in the book, not from the standpoint of lack of those things, but just presenting the evidence and the research about how those things are so important in helping to counteract the effect of toxic stress. Um, so I think they are incredibly important. Um, I feel like um, there maybe is a, a, conversa a national conversation happening around screen time, or maybe it's just in like the moms that, in my, in my peer group, and then also a lot of the parents that I, that I care for. It feels like um, there are more and more conversations about screen time. Uh, I know my own five-year-old, he literally will say, Mama, can I have some screen time? Because we ration it out to him, like, um, like 15 minutes, you know. Um, but I think those are all really important things, and I think that they are, um, I don't know about, um, about lack of structure and lack of discipline that doesn't tend to, um, uh, well, actually, not that that's not um, the issue in my patient population. I would say when we talk about um, structure and, um, and discipline, one of the things that we want to, I think the big focus has been a focus on, you know, positive parenting and how to implement um, a healthy structure, healthy routines um, for kids. Uh, but all of the things that you said I think are important. Over here. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, I'm not sure how prevalent this is, but um, I was wondering if you've developed any way to successfully screen for trauma that um, is covered up and stored in the subconscious. Um, so, or any way to screen um, children who have little to no awareness um, of the trauma that they've experienced. I think that that, pro that uh, question could probably be better answered by the very wise gentleman who just <laughs> asked me the last question, considering you're a child and adolescent uh, psychiatrist. But I am, you know, when, when we do the ACE screening, number one, for our kids who are uh, zero to 12, we actually ask the caregiver about the child's history of exposure. And for our patients who are uh, 13 to 18, we ask about, um, we ask the, for the caregiver to give a report, and we also ask the child to do a self-report. But one of the things that I think um, is really important is that when we talk about um, uh, adversities, we're screening for exposure. We do not, um, we're screening for exposure, not symptomatology because what we're looking for is risk, right? Our goal, oftentimes by, a, by the time a child is symptomatic, really, this biological process has been going on in their bodies for so long that it's literally affecting their neurologic functioning. And so our goal is really to identify which kids are at risk, hopefully before they get to that point. Right, and our, um, we're really trying to understand, uh, you know, with our screening tool, we've tried to make it very fast and easy to identify which patients are at low risk, moderate risk, or high risk for toxic stress. And that is what our, our screening tool does. And the point of it is the reason we screen in primary care, right, at the pediatrician's office, is so that we can make sure that every child is screened. The first time we see a kid is when they're, right, like 
a minute old. You come out the oven, you gotta see a pediatrician, right? And so, you know, our goal is really, number one, to incorporate the screening as a routine part of the regular pediatric health visit, so that, by the way, parents can be educated and understand that these exposures affect their child's health, right? And then also, hopefully, we can do this detection as early as possible, and hopefully, long before, I mean, when a child is pre-verbal, we want to understand what exposures there, um, so that we can do um, the appropriate interventions and use early intervention. Nadine, I want to watch the time because you've been going since 7.30 this morning, so you're on hour number 13. <laughs> um, and you arrived in Chicago not feeling well, and you're still not feeling well, so I want to be respectful of that. And you are going to be out in the lobby also signing books and yes. answering a few more questions. All that in mind, then Susan, go ahead and take it. We'll take two more. I know there's about 40 more that you could be answered, but I also just try to go easy on you. Thank you. So Susan, you had someone, didn't you, Susan? Hi, Susan. good day. Uh, okay, go thank you again for being here, uh, f fellow Caribbean person in the house. Um, my kids are adopted, and we have a fairly large group of adoptive family, families in our circle, most of whom the kids have been adopted right at birth. So my question kind of has to do with trauma during gestation or during mm -hmm. pregnancy. Has mm -hmm. any of your data talked about that or looked at that? Yeah. Um, as a parent of adopted children as well, um, I, I am like in solidarity with you. And I think one of the things that we understand, so it's not just, here's one of the things that's really interesting. Um, we know that adversity that is um, exposed, uh, adversity that, for example, uh, that uh, is experienced in utero or ex adversity that mom experiences when she's pregnant can affect both pregnancy outcomes and health outcomes for the child. But here's what's nuts. We're, it's, we're now understanding that mom's preconceptional ACE score can also impact health outcomes. And in fact, in the original CDC Kaiser study, what they found was that if for the, for the young women who got pregnant, um, I think who had a teen pregnancy before the age of 18, for those of them who had four or more ACEs, they were twice as likely to lose that baby as the, the young women who had an ACE score of zero. So um, the changes to the hormonal systems and the immune system um, are actually impact pregnancy outcomes and can impact the perinatal health of the child. Okay, last question right Last here. question. All right, uh, so I have two things to say quickly. One's an advertisement and one is a question. One, just quickly, the reason so many people raised their hands that they knew about the ACEs study is Illinois actually has a lot of people doing amazing work. So if you're here tonight because you knew that, great. But if you're here and you're hearing this aha moment, please go and look into some research on the Child Trauma Coalition. There's Look Through Their Eyes. There's the Partnership for Resilience. There's lots of people in our state that are looking at trauma-informed hospitals and schools and cities and policies. So don't leave here thinking that you can't do something, because you can. So that's my first thing, um, including Dick Durbin has legislation for trauma-informed schools that's national. So we have people in our state that have heard our stories and are bringing our words, so please get involved in advocacy. The second thing is a question. Knowing that you have this motivated group, what do you see as the sort of low-hanging fruit that you've seen as you've had these conversations that can really help communities to build a trauma-informed, caring, safe, stable relationships like you were talking about? What's been your experience of the most effective thing that we can do that you can share with us? Wow. Um, I would say in terms of the low-hanging fruit, uh, what some of the most important things that, that folks can do is really to get educated, right? Educate themselves, buy my book. <laughs> no, but really um, uh, get educated and to make these connections with each other. 
I think one of the most important things that we can be doing right now, um, especially as we are growing in awareness, right, is understanding how um, we create connections across systems to be able to um, do things like, um, you know, do identification, you know, multidisciplinary care, whether, that, whether that's in a healthcare setting, right, and connecting that to what's happening in the educational setting. One of the things that was, and that, that lowers the, the, the burden for everyone. One of the things that was really powerful for me was when we first started this work, we felt like we were, had to do everything at the Center for Youth Wellness, right? So we were trying to right, bring all of these resources and we worked really hard to do that, to have this multidisciplinary care. And then this amazing thing started happening as this was happening more and more commonly in San Francisco, which was, as I would sit down with my patients and talk about, you know, what are the sources of buffering and what are the sources of resilience in their community, um, it would be, oh, well, I'm already doing mindfulness at school, right? When I'd go through the six things, right? They'd be like, oh, yeah, mindfulness, I'm doing that at school. And, oh, yeah, you know, I have access to, you know, this wonderful mental health care through this community-based organization. And all of a sudden, it didn't feel like we had to be doing everything in our center. And that is the day that I'm looking forward to when... You know, in you know, despite the fact that we have dramatically re reduced the uh, you know the prevalence of ACEs in our community, when it does come up, right? It'll be like, oh, okay, so you're getting so and -so, you know, you're getting you know your multidisciplinary care here, or you're, you're okay, you're getting this from these folks and this from these folks and this from these folks, and it will simply be like this matter of course, right? We where we have this. Um, this ecological system, right, that supports our kids. And I think that those, right now, for those of us who are doing the work, some of, a really big part of what we can be doing right now is connecting with others who are doing, also doing excellent work, hopefully complementary work, right, so that we can make sure that we, can, we have that full ecological system and we connect, can connect our clients, our students, our patients, our families with these sources of care in the community. Thank you, Dr. Brookers. Thank you so much.